Recorded live. Welcome once again to Zeitgeist Philadelphia Radio. Uh, this is call ID number 91812 on talkshoe.com. Uh, today is, uh, I'm here with Mark Passio. Hey, Mark. How you doing? I'm doing really great. Thanks so much for bringing me on to the show today. Oh, thank you for being on your uh, website, What on Earth is Happening, has been an immense resource that I don't know if I could have made it through the last few years without. It, it's been very helpful uh, having the knowledge base that you have there, like, accessible and easy for me to even be like, okay, you want to know about what, what this concept is of what I'm talking about? Maybe you might want to take a look at this. And sometimes I draw upon your work and other times... Uh, the works of other uh, independent researchers as well, but uh, I have to admit that your work is definitely uh, something that I have uh, not only had an appreciation for, but have definitely relied upon for a while now, and it, it, it's a really great body of knowledge that I think more people should definitely look into. Well, I really, really appreciate that, and uh, you know that's what I intended the site to be, and um, uh, I'm glad that people are, are using it in that capacity and uh, recommending it to others uh, because I think it's, it is critical information for us to uh, learn and deeply understand at the time period in history in which we are living because um, things are rapidly um, uh, heading south, you could say. And if we don't um, you know, really deeply in- integrate the knowledge, specific knowledge of natural law, uh, humanity is going to be in for a very, very, very rough ride in, the, in, in its future, in its near future. Uh, and that uh, negative dystopic future is coming into, into view, and a lot of people you know, are starting to see that is what's occurring, but they still don't really understand the causal factors for why that's happening. And uh, that's what I like to think that my work on that website, uh, specifically uh, the podcast section and the, the information on natural law, uh, brings to the table in that it helps people to understand the causal factors of uh, why what is taking place is actually going on and how we ultimately have uh, uh, created that uh, ongoing condition. Uh, when we understand natural law, then we can reverse that negative trend and, and bring about a positive outcome, but only if we understand how those laws of creation work. Uh, it's funny that you use the words that you do sometimes because I, I feel like your um, you, you, your explanations of things are very much a demystification of the truth. And so many people these days have this like mystified concept, a uh, 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 mysticism like concepts of of um, of what the truth is, and almost like in that uh, Indiana Jones type of concept when it comes to, like, uh, uh, the, the professor for truth is down the hall, we're here for facts. And, and you kind of bring those, you bridge those two classes together in a lot of ways. Sure. I mean, that, that's, that's part of the whole problem with uh, understanding what's going on is that so many people try to overcomplicate things and bring mysticism into it. And I do feel that that's part of what I do is try to simplify, try to demystify things because truth is actually very elegant and simple. It, you know, it, it's not overly complicated and we don't need to overthink things. There's a lot of different components to what's taking place and what's going on, but <clears throat> they're really just simple building blocks and none of them are so overly complicated that it's even difficult for a person of even modest or average intelligence to understand. Um, we have to understand that truth isn't this concept of, you know, the totality of everything or the mind of God or, you know, something, you know, you know ridiculously uh, vast that is so impossible to attain. It's actually something quite simple. It's that which has occurred in the past and that which is occurring in the present moment. In other words, what is, that which is, and that which is going on, uh, the, the things that are happening within us and around us, that's it. It's, and it's not based on perception. It's an objective standard quality that simply exists. And the problem is the human ego 
often goes into a state of denial about that which is, and it doesn't want to realize it, and it doesn't want to accept it, and it doesn't want to wrestle with the implications of the condition that is currently manifesting, which is the truth. And uh, when, when the ego stays stuck in that kind of a mindset, and it wants to be the arbiter of truth, and it wants to say, uh, I'm going to t- determine that which is based on my perceptions, my likes, my preferences, my whims, instead of saying truth is objective and it's not based on my perceptions or anybody else's, it's just that which uh, it, it do- does not waver and that which simply is. And I'm going to uh, get my ego out of the way. My attachments have to be dissolved and, and set out of the way so that I can bring my perceptions into alignment with, with that which is. That's called coming into alignment with the truth or bringing our perceptions into alignment with truth. And that's the goal. That's the, what humanity is actually charged with doing by the universe, I guess you could say. It's, it's what our task is, our work is to align our perceptions with truth. And based on the state of mind that humanity is in collectively, that could be a very difficult thing to do because humanity, for lack of a better term, and just to say it very bluntly, is under very deep mind control. And until we decide that we want to come out of that mind control and accept things for as they are and start seeing reality for what it is and not trying to be arbiters of truth anymore, stuck in deep ego attachment, we're going to continue to suffer and we're going to continue to create very negative consequences for ourselves because we're not bringing our perception into alignment with the actual state of reality. Or what I would just simply say is the condition that I call the existence of natural law, the the laws of creation, the laws of morality. Until we bring our perception and then our behaviors subsequently into alignment with those laws and that reality, all we, can, all we can create for ourselves is chaos and slavery. If we want to create order and freedom, then we have to understand natural law and we have to bring our, align, we have to bring our perceptions into alignment with the existence of those laws. Then we have to bring our behaviors. In, once we understand that those laws exist, then we need to bring our behavior into alignment with those laws. I understand exactly what you're talking about, too, because... Uh, even when you are at a relatively higher level of consciousness, it's not always as easy to bring yourself into alignment with those things considering our situation. Like people could end up in a situation where they are forced to do nothing but get food from a pantry and they may give them, give people like meats and so on. And those types of meats are, uh, generally taken from like factory farming around the world or overfishing, uh, and and it, it it's definitely taking a large toll on our planet when it comes to these sorts of uh, levels of consciousness that we seem to be. Uh, some of us are again, like you were saying, becoming in line with them. Others are definitely breaking away from that line, such as taking our taking what you said when it comes to mind control into, like, people just believing what they see on the news, uh, right. taking in everything that the, the, the whole culture in general tells them to believe, such as Hollywood and so on. Yeah, and it seems like that divide, instead of closing, seems to be widening, because those who are of low consciousness, you could think of it as they don't have much shielding for the incoming flux of that propaganda and mind control Uh, those mind control techniques. So as the system ramps up to try to maintain its control, um, those people are going to be more affected because it's like they don't have, again, like a shielding built up, or you could look at it like they don't have a muscle mass built up to to hold the weight of something that's being dumped upon them. And uh, they seem to be collapsing faster and faster under this. But um, the people who have done their homework and have built themselves up and strengthened themselves seem to have more shielding, so to speak, to uh, uh, see through those forms of manipulation and uh, propaganda. And uh, they're having an easier time moving forward and releasing attachment to uh, other uh, lies that they had previously bought into. And they're, they're bringing their perceptions more and more into alignment with truth and natural law. 
So uh, it, it's, the go- it's the job. Let me state this emphatically because a lot of people don't think that this is the job of the conscious. It is the job of the conscious people of this world to help to bridge that divide and bring those people who have not been able to stand under their, un- under their own strength to help them come along in this transition. I very vehemently uh, am opposed to the idea that we should just cut those people off and let them go and let them deteriorate. Uh, that is a very separatist worldview, a very uh, isolated worldview of seeing the self as separate from everything else. Uh, w- we are the same. We are one with these people at a very deep level of consciousness, at a unified level. And what happens with the whole aggregate body of humanity is also what's going to happen to us. It's, we're not going to be separate or insulated from those results or consequences. This is what people have to understand. Even if you only look at it from a perspective of uh, enlightened self-interest and not a perspective of true oneness, you know, uh, from a level of deep awareness and consciousness, even if you only looked at it from a semi-selfish perspective, we're in the same situation as these people. We're on the same planet. We're not going to be insulated from the consequences of their unconsciousness. You know, that's going to carry over and affect us. You know, so as they're suffering, we're going to suffer too. So it is our responsibility, if we're in a place of higher knowledge and higher consciousness, to help to educate those people, even if they don't want it, even if we we sense that they're completely resistant to it. You have to continue to exercise persistence and boldness and talk about that which is. Talk about the truth absolutely unwaveringly, relentlessly at all times and places until our voices form enough of a chorus to finally break through, even if it's just to put a little chink in that armor of propaganda and mind control that's surrounding them. You know, that that is our moral responsibility, and too few people understand that. Too few people are doing that work, and too many people have the attitude, well, that's just on them. It's not just on them. Obviously, you know, the karmic brunt of ignoring the truth is going to have a, its toll on them uh, in this reality and any other. But uh, what I'm saying is we're also shirking our personal responsibility if we're not actively bringing the truth out there to the quote-unquote asleep masses in an unapologetic, straightforward, easy-to-understand way and in a way that helps to spread it in a distributed of a fashion as possible and in a wide, widely and freely available way as possible. That is the moral responsibility of the quote-unquote awake uh, individuals out there. So I just want to emphatically state my position on that. I, I understand completely. Uh, and, and I agree completely as well when it comes to specifically that work that we need to do on ourselves. I personally uh, I mean, when you, you and I first met like six years ago at the, at the first Night Tech uh, show in that I saw, um, I was definitely a different person back then because I hadn't really done that work on myself. Sure. I was still being affected by my family and how, uh, they, and, and the suggestions that they said I should do with my life, considering like my uncle was a cop and my father was a prison guard. And like, until you really go into like learning about, say, the Zimbardo stuff happened up in that college where, where like they uh, made a prison there and, and, and forced people to, to like participate in this game where, where they were, well, they didn't force them. It was originally a scientific drama that was being played out, but it became a real psychological drama that lost all of the scientific perspective. And until you go into these types of understandings about yourself and, and get that deeper knowledge about about who you really are and where you really come from because the, the question is, it, it is always there, like um, how much of you is really you because of the past that has created you. So you right. have to kind of like do that work where you have to unlearn what you have learned. Yes, exactly. And, you know, that really brings us to uh, another very important topic or point and it's something that a lot of people also, I feel, have very confused or take polarizing sides when really the truth is uh, not at either of those uh, artificially created polar opposite sides. It it lies in the balance 
often between the two, uh, and often a, a third path altogether, really, you could say. And that is w- w- when it comes to what is human nature. You know, uh, people believe erroneously that the human condition of brainwashing and mind control is human nature. That's not human nature, that's the human condition. So, you know, it wasn't your nature to be in a state where you were being influenced by things that weren't true. That was your current condition many years ago. My, cur- my current condition was not reflective of the essence of my nature when I was a dark, black-hearted Satanist um, with an absolutely poisoned, psych- semi-psychopathic worldview uh, 20 years back. Okay, That was not my nature that was actually showing or coming through. That was my brainwashed condition. That was my condition of being under different forms of mind control and different levels of ignorance. And when I came out of that, I shed all of that, and now I'm under a completely different condition. So we we really have to talk when, when we talk about nature in general, okay, which is what what natural law is derived from, okay, meaning natural, inherent, that which is a an inherent quality of a thing. That's what it means to be, be to have a certain nature. So you ask, what is the nature of a human being? And so many people, you know, this is again, it's a very polarizing question because. There's so many people who have the view human beings are inherently bad somehow, that their nature is flawed and bad and evil. Then you'll you'll have other people, uh, definitely more of a minority, but still you'll have other people that just say, no, human beings' nature is fundamentally good. And, you know, uh, they they are uh, divine in their their nature. And, you know, they come into the world in in a perfect state. And then some people say, no, we're, we're... we uh, have a demonic influence in us. We come into the world in original sin and in a flawed state. So there's this big polarization when it comes to human nature. And what I part of my work is I try to explain to people neither of those things are true. Our nature is not fundamentally good or angelic, nor is it fundamentally bad or demonic. And we have to um, really understand that ultimately we as a human being, behave in a similar way to a, a, a computer that can be programmed to output a specific quality of information and behavior. So I'm not saying that human beings are computers. We have free will. We have free will to make the behavioral choices that we are going to make, but the behavioral choices we choose are influenced by our mind, the condition of our mind. Okay, and the condition of our mind is invariably uh, a result of the information that we have taken in, processed, and then accepted as being true. So, like a computer, you could say um, a, a computer has several things that determine how it's going to behave and whether it's going to put quality output onto whatever output device you're, you're looking at the information on, whether you're going to put the information onto your screen, out through your printer, onto another hard drive, onto the Internet, onto a web page, whatever, okay? So uh, when we look at a computer, we don't say, well, what's the nature of that computer? All computers' nature is the same. It's programmable, and it's to do a specific task, set of tasks with information, and that's the nature of a computer. It, it, it computes. It takes in information. It processes information. It outputs information. Well, this is very similar to human nature. Okay? And again, notice it's different than the human condition. The human condition can be very, flaw, very flawed, very you know, out of balance, or it could be you know, very in alignment with truth, very in balance. A condition is something different than our nature at its essence inherently. And like a computer, I would say a human being's uh, nature is we're beings that take in information, process it, and then output it through behavior. So just let's compare it to a computer for a moment, right? If uh, a computer has well, a computer has a a file system format, okay? So on the hard drive, you're going to load a file system, okay? That could be like NTFS on Windows or uh, EXT file format on, on Linux or 
uh, a Mac OS extended format on, on Mac OS or whatever, okay? So that's the file system. That prepares the way. It formats the hard drive, all right? That's that. When you format a hard drive, you're laying down a file system that's going to act as the cataloging mechanism for all the files and programs you're going to load into that computer. Now, that's the conditions during a child's formative years. And you'll notice when we say formative years, the word format is in there. Format, that's the formatting. That's the information that's getting laid down to format the brain, the hard drive of the child during their very, very, very early years of life. And when we're in our first six years of life, we're in a condition of that is akin, it is likened to a hypnagogic state, meaning a state that is between a waking or full consciousness and dreaming or, or subconsciousness or unconsciousness. It is a state in which that young child, through the first six years or so of its life, <coughs> automatically takes in anything that is thrown at it, any piece of data that is thrown at it. It doesn't go through processing, a processing stage. It's just taken in and it gets laid down as the format, literally, of the child's mind, of their psyche. And, you know, so, you know people will question, well, why even is that? What, what made it that way? That seems like a very inefficient thing that, you know, it, it takes in all of it, good and bad. And that's why it's so important to program the mind of a child at a young age with very good, truthful information and, you know, not uh, p put in a poisonous worldview system and a worldview system based in exploitation, violence, etc. You know, that child is really becoming, the personality is becoming the con going to be the condition of that child's mind, uh, you know, in their early life and on into their adult life, most likely, unless their, their constitution is strong and they're surrounded with good influences later that can break that bad conditioning. So once that bad conditioning is laid down, it, it can be difficult for someone to overcome that early formatting programming. I mean, think about it. You want to repartition a hard drive when it's loaded with data. That's often not an easy task, and it's not an easy task to do without doing some damage to that, to that hard drive as well. So, you know, let's continue with this analogy for a moment. The operating system goes in next into a computer. Well, what is our operating system? Our operating system is our culture, right? It's all the the programming that we receive that forms the way things, the way people generally do things in our cultural area. And again, like uh, some researchers have said, culture is not necessarily a good thing. It is a form of programming. It is, a, it is something that is like almost rigidly imposed. And again, changing your operating system <laughs> without doing harm to your data or losing it can be a challenge on a computer. So, you know, getting out of that cultural programming takes a lot of rewiring in, the, in the, 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 the condition of the being. So this is all things that form the human condition, right? What we're really talking about is the difference between the condition that we end up being in versus human nature, which I'm going to get to exactly what human nature simply is. So then we put programs in after the operating system goes down. And that's, you know, software, right? So we have the file system then we have the operating system, then we have the software programs. These are our belief systems and patterns on an individual level, okay? What we feel about what's true, our, our perceptions, our likes, our preferences. And if they're erroneous and they're rigid and they're dogmatic and they're, fa they're false, it's like opening up a program that's corrupted and trying to do uh, data processing with it. How about if you tried to put data into a spreadsheet program that had hundreds, if not thousands of bugs and, and software errors in it. And you tried to then process the spreadsheet data for like maybe, uh, you know, the, the, the monies that were made by a company during the course of a year. You'd have all kinds of errors all over your data. And it wouldn't be very efficient in running a business, let's say. Okay, so you wouldn't want software with bugs in it, with errors in it. And that's what, what, ha what we do. When we try to run data through false belief systems, or you could call them false religions, you're going to spit out data on the other side that's going to be bad for what you want to do in life, and you're going to get chaotic outcomes. And then finally, the, the output of the human computer system, quote unquote, is the behavior. So we have all of these things, the, the formative programming of the child during the first six years of their life. 
the culture that we grow up in with all of its conditions and assumptions and you know quirks and ways of doing things and then we have the um uh belief systems that get programmed in from the environment okay and that would be the software Finally, all these things come together. That's the, all the processing is, that's going on with all that information, and then it comes together, and it goes out through our behavior. That's the output. That would be like printing the data from the computer, displaying it on the screen, sending it up to the Internet in some form. The output is behavior, and we output that onto life, the screen called life. So think about it. The, the nature of the, the human being is that it is programmable with data, with information, with beliefs that can be processed, okay? And then when we process all that data that comes in, we can do something either orderly and good with it, or we could do something that is chaotic and harmful and, and evil with it. But the condition is different than the nature. The nature of a human being is that we like a computer – are programmable beings, and the output, the behavioral output, is going to be dependent upon the quality of the information that gets put in, just like a computer. It's that old adage in computer lingo, garbage goes in, garbage comes out. Quality information goes in and is processed accurately, then quality behavior comes out of the human being. That's the human nature, is that we are programmable through information, and dependent on the quality of information, the output through behavior can be changed. The condition is, unfortunately, um, right now, the human condition is deplorable. It's the computer with the bad file system format, because we're all getting bad data when we're young. Okay, It's the operating system, because our culture is all programmed, programmed children that never really grew up and became true responsible adults that are aware of truth. The belief systems or software programs we're running are terrible with tons of bugs and errors in them that output bad behavior onto the screen called life. That's the human condition. That doesn't mean that's our nature. The nature is we are capable of taking in information, processing it, and then outputting it through behavior. And if we do that in an efficient way that is based in truth, the behavioral output, which governs the quality of the total conditions of our society is going to be highly e efficient and good. And if we don't process truth, don't process data accurately, and we continue to run bad programs that are based on erroneous belief systems, dogmatic, rigid beliefs that aren't true, we're going to output bad behavior, and the quality of the generated result is going to be chaotic. It's going to be chaos, and ultimately it's going to continue to be chaotic until it goes down the path of deeper and deeper and deeper bondage, ending in total slavery, which is almost where we are at now. We're in slavery, but we're still in what I would call semi-free range form of slavery, of a, of a farm system on earth, of a human farm. Okay, we're, If this disorder in our processing mechanisms and, and the, belief, the untrue belief systems that we are willing to accept and act upon co continues to go on unabated. Humanity is going into a form of 100% total bondage that is going to be outright totalitarian slavery. That is not going to, there's going to be a prison where you are going to be aware you're actively living the life of a slave. We're almost there yet, but it's not quite what I would call that hardcore nature slavery. It's still a soft form of slavery right now, but it's rapidly moving toward that hard form of slavery uh, daily, by the day, and rapidly growing uh, faster uh, in, uh, in, in, at an increasing pace. We're accelerating toward that negative outcome. And once again, the solution is to understand the difference between the human condition versus human nature and to understand Human nature is simply a programmable state where we can redirect the outcome when we feed in proper, truthful information into the computer, process it accurately, and then base our behaviors upon that, that truth, which is the truth of natural law, which I would like to possibly get into that a little bit deeper so people can have a better understanding of what that is.
Please do. I, I mean, I, I definitely want to touch on how you bring down, like, I, I, I'm looking forward to, to the moment when, like, you, you just, well, I, I guess uh, what I've learned specifically, I should say, is that it is all broken down into theft. Yes. It, 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 we, we have to acknowledge and be responsible for our own um, property, which is our, our bodies and ourselves and our minds and the, the outputs of those things, as well as to be responsible and, and respective of other people's properties in the same fashion. In the last right. episode I did, in the last episode I did, it was specifically all about uh, consent. Yes. And that we, we very, we definitely touched on for quite a bit of the show uh, uh, about like how like you own you, I own me. And, and like, I, I get to choose what I get to do with my body. You get to choose what you get to do with your body and, and those sorts of things. And that definitely was a, a good basis of where, where to start at with, with the conversation. I, I, I always thought, but then Sometimes property, I think, I, I also, what I want to get at with you at some point is where property changes from, um, uh, I guess, goes beyond From, from legitimate property. to illegitimate. From yes. legitimacy to something that really isn't true property. Oh, sure, we could definitely get into that. I, I, I would hope to clarify that uh, uh, on this particular broadcast because I think that's a good place to go. And um, uh, what you're saying is so on point. You know, this is about the takers and not continuing to be one, you know, to use a Daniel Quinn analogy, uh, you know, and from the, from the movie Instinct with Anthony Hopkins, you know, the concept of the takers, you know, those who want to come along and take that which is not theirs to take in the form of property, rights, freedom, life even. So, um very, very important to understand that all of natural law is underlay by – it really comes down to one thing. To cut to the end of the chase right away, it comes down to don't take that which is not yours. Don't, take, don't steal. Don't be a taker. Don't be a thief, period. That's what all natural law boils down to. So we could build up to, to that and come around full circle back to the idea of theft and, and property and what is property and what it is not, most certainly not. So, um, yeah, I mean, that sounds like a, a good plan to move forward. I think first uh, what we should do is define what I mean by the term natural law because many people will have heard this term in different contexts. What I absolutely do not mean by natural law is any form of man's law or man's uh, interpretation on the laws of men, okay? It has – natural law is not written anywhere. People say, where can I – read the natural law. I get emails like this. Where can I read natural law? And it doesn't mean there aren't some books that talk about it and touch on the laws of nature, the laws of morality that exist in nature. There are people who do talk about it, and many different traditions have attempted to teach it. But um, it's not like a codified system that exists in one place that, you know, that you're going to re read in, in writing in, in one book or in one you know, uh, manual, and you're going to say, oh, that's all there is to it, and I know everything there is to know about it. That's first and foremost. Secondly, um, it's not John Locke's system. It's not, you know, any man's system that they have referred to as natural law. That's not what I'm talking about when I talk about natural law. So people will say, oh, you're just re repeating what this philosopher coined under this term. No, that's not what natural law is. Another thing it is not, it has zero to do with any concept of Darwinian theory. I'm not talking about what people will erroneously refer to as the quote-unquote natural order, okay? So it has nothing to do with Darwin, nothing to do with his unproven theories, nothing to do with the quote natural order as people of a scien scientism mindset – um, which is very left brain imbalanced mindset, often think of as the quote unquote natural order. Um, that concept of survival of the most ruthless 
and human beings acting like animals in the wild, okay, has nothing to do with nature, nor does it have anything to do with order. I call it the artificially imposed chaos, that concept of the quote-unquote natural order, because it's the exact opposite of natural, and it's the exact opposite of orderly. I call it artificially imposed chaos, okay, through, through brainwashing and mind control. That's what leads people to act like the animal in the jungle, in the field, that is going to go and ruthlessly, uh, you know, tear up everything around it, take whatever it wants, and, you know, just uh, act in its total instinctual animalistic capacities. There's nothing orderly in that. Nothing could come about that is orderly from that mode of behavior, okay? So that shouldn't even be called the natural order. And I think that we need to decondition ourselves from even thinking of that as the natural order because it has nothing to do with nature nor order. So let's define the terms first. In a very um, simplistic, demystifying, and even scientific way, okay, what does natural mean? What does the word natural actually mean? Natural, by definition, means inherent to creation having a basis in nature or reality, based in truth. That's what natural means, okay? So um, it is not made or caused by hu humankind. Or it's not made or caused by any 3D being if it's natural, okay? Uh, we didn't make the earth. We didn't make the laws of gravity, okay? We didn't make the oceans. These are naturally occurring things. Creation made these things. We didn't make the universe. It's natural, okay? So that's all natural means in a scientific sense. In inherent, having a basis in reality, having a basis in truth, not made or caused by humanity, period. Natural, okay? The word law, let's define it. And again, I'm not talking about man's law, not written decrees that are the whims of legislators, which is what I would call man's law. We're talking about something completely different than man's law. Law with a capital L are, is existing conditions which are binding and immutable. Binding, they have an effect and immutable. They cannot be changed. I think I, I – am I hearing break music? No, no, no. Okay. I'm sorry. Go on. It was just a little uh, bit I of ba background coming through. I thought maybe that was uh, – we were going to take a break. But I'll, I'll, that, that's okay. Sorry about the confusion. I'll just continue. So – Law is just uh, uh, conditions that are binding and immutable. We're talking about capital L law, not man's written laws, okay? Like gravity is a law, okay? It's a condition that is existing, it is extant, it is binding, meaning it has an effect. It doesn't matter whether you believe in it. Belief in it is irrelevant. You either understand how the law operates, and therefore you exist in harmony with it, and you don't suffer as a result of walking off of high... Uh, cliffs, ledges, and buildings, okay, and then suffering the negative consequences of not understanding how gravity operates, or you exist in harmony with it, in which case you don't do things like that and, you know, fall down and go splat, okay? So that's what uh, a law is. It's something that is in nature, it exists, it's a, a binding condition, meaning it has an effect whether you understand it or not, uh, and it's immutable. Nothing you can do can change how gravity operates in our world. You can counteract it through technology temporarily, but that doesn't mean that law is still not in effect. It is not in effect. It's still in effect. Even when we're in an airplane, gravity is in effect. It's just that the laws of lift and thrust are being actively applied to counteract it, to counterman gravity for a time. Okay? And, um, you know, uh, immutable means there's nothing we can do to change it. It's going to exist no matter what we do, ultimately. Uh, it, that m it means cannot be changed. So that's what – we put these two things together, and we have inherent non-man-made conditions that are both binding and immutable, meaning laws that were created by nature that are in effect. My working definition is universal, non-man-made, binding and immutable conditions – that govern the consequences of behavior. And there's the catch. There's the rub, you could say. That what these laws do is they bind our behavioral decisions to give to us consequences with 
different qualities based upon the behavioral free will decisions that we've enacted and put into effect in reality. So if we behave one way, we're going to get a certain set of results. If we behave a different way, we get an opposing, an opposite set of, a diametrically opposed set of results. So now let me just clarify this. When I say the consequences of behavior, I mean the behavior of beings that have been gifted with free will and the ability to comprehend these natural laws. Okay? So people will say, well, if natural law exists, would it, wouldn't, it, would, wouldn't it apply equally to the animals, to the animal kingdom? Why, is, why can a lion take down a deer on the you know, plains of Africa and you know, that's not a natural law offense? Because a lion is an animal that no matter how much explaining about natural law, about the laws of morality, uh, and you know, co- uh, coexistence with other beings in a non-harmful capacity, that you can possibly say to that being, it, its brain capacity and the electrochemical composition of the complexity of its brain can never arrive at an understanding of those laws. Therefore, those laws are not going to be applicable to an animal. The reason that they're applicable to a human is because we do have a brain that is of the complexity to comprehend the existence of these laws of consequence. And therefore... So basically, it yes. seems like you're suggesting that, like, um, I heard a little tagline before, like a bumper sticker type of wisdom. It said, um, respect existence or expect resistance. That's right. And in some ways, that actually is in the animal kingdom. If you even think about, say, an antelope's horns can be used defensively against said lion. So they do have their own natural levels of if, if the lion doesn't respect the existence, the, the, the existence of, uh, of the antelope, the, sure. it, it may get resistance by getting and stabbed with that horn, with those horns. That's right. And guess what? Would that be an absolute right of that antelope to put one right in the belly of that lion? You better believe it would. You better believe it. That exactly. would be, in, in animal terms, a natural law consequence. Exactly. And a right. I would call that a natural law right. Any animal that is being attacked for its life uh, has a right to resist with deadly force. You know, including human beings. But we'll get to that. Exactly, yes. yes. So this does, these laws, in that sense, do exist in nature. But what I'm talking about is the behavioral conscious result. Conscious thought, yes. Yes. At a conscious level, it doesn't apply to an animal. So when we behave immorally, we're going to get a chaotic result according to natural laws in our experience of life. Uh, that's what I mean. It, um, that's what I mean by it uh, acts as the governing dynamics of um, behavior of intelligent beings, or beings. Let's not even say intelligent beings, because God knows we're not an intelligent species just yet. Uh, we are a species that has the capacity for true intelligence. Okay, we're working, or some of us at least are working toward that goal, but. Um, if the capacity for intelligence and the understanding of these laws exists in a species, then those laws apply to them. Okay? That's what I'm saying regarding how natural law works, how it governs, what creatures it governs. So, again, um, the, these natural laws are not the laws of the jungle applying to the animal kingdom. Okay? If uh, a pride of lions goes out and hunts and kills some antelopes on the field, the pride of lions does not necessarily experience horrific consequences that are brought on by natural law, okay? Um, if a human being treats animals a certain way and treats humans a certain way, okay, that, are, that is harmful and that is completely not within their rights, then, yes, we do experience negative consequences. It, it, Actually, it, it reminded of, um, of uh, uh, Les Mis. Like, if you think about the conditionalities of, uh, of the... the how things were set up, like the little girl was hungry, so Jean Valjean stole bread for food, and then, like, these are the conditions that, that were set up, like, he's poor, so he's in that condition where he still needs to be his daughter. 
Right. Uh, and then you've got ten years later, this got this this one guy um, Javert. He's been chasing the guy down for ten years over stealing this loaf of bread, and then right. figures out that oh wait, uh, a criminal isn't necessarily uh, a quote unquote criminal isn't necessarily a bad person who right. has that evil nature that you were speaking of, and that even caused him because he had spent all these years chasing this guy down sure. and in this mentality of, sure. of trying to uh, of, of trying to impose these sorts of man-made orders and man-made laws right. on him it it, it, could, it caused a, a condition of um uh cognitive dissonance in him in right. the end where he tried where he killed himself at over right. which is, which is why it's a beautiful allegory and and moreover what's the ultimate wrong that's committed there uh, in a society of abundance, you're keeping hungry people star- in a starving condition because you don't want to exactly. do a simple thing like share resources, you know, uh, treating somebody with basic human dignity and respect, you know. That, that's a disrespect for life right there, you know. So Yeah, that let them eat cake mentality. You know, that, that is what's creating large amounts of disorder and chaos societally is just staying in that kind of a mindset. You know, so and, and we can get into that and going toward a uh, natural law based resource economy, you know, later on in the show. But continuing with with natural law, um, it doesn't require anybody's belief. It's not a religion. This isn't a mystical system. Like, you know, that's one of the first things I really want to clarify, especially to like, you know, a listening audience that might be coming from a background, uh, you know, with zeitgeist or uh, nat- uh, a resource based economy, et cetera. OK. Um, this has nothing to do with religion, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just clarify that emphatically. It has zero to do with religion. It's not a belief system. It's a set of laws that exist in nature. And look, people will say, how can I verify the existence of natural law? Well, how can you verify the existence of gravity? How can you verify the existence of any natural phenomenon? There's this little thing, you may have heard of it, it's called the scientific method, okay? It applies very, very equally and works very well when applied to natural law, to trying to understand the existence and operation of natural law. Well, what do you do during the scientific methodology? Okay, you're going to first formulate a hypothesis about how something may or may not work. That's your model, your working model. Then you're going to test that hypothesis through observation, well, do, do laws that govern the consequences of behavior exist? That could be our hypothesis. We're going to pose that question. Then we're going to observe, well, what happens when we behave in certain ways? What does society become like? We make our observations, okay? We filter that data set. Oh, we, say, we compare it to another data set, controls. Well, what happens if we do exist? Our behavior is in accordance with these laws that we're going to look at what they are. Okay, if they are in accordance with the laws of morality, then what happens? Does something different happen? Does a different set of results occur? Okay, and then you make those observations and you log the data. Then you compare and contrast, and then you repeat. You don't just do it once. You you do that a lot of times. You look at many different societies. You look at many different time periods. You look at many different cultures. You do it in your own life. Hey, you want to test natural law? Do it in your own life. You know, act like a total ass around everybody you come into contact with and see what the quality of your life takes on, what what kind of quality (laughs) your life takes on. Then act in accordance with natural law and treat others with respect and dignity and, and, you know, find out what uh, quality your life takes on. You know, that's how I tested natural law personally. I learned through a whole lot of suffering what not to do, how not to exist, how not to behave, how not to be in this world. It took years of my life to finally admit, you know what? I shouldn't be like this. I shouldn't behave like this. And until I suffered to the point where I was almost at death's door, you know, that's what it took for me. I was a hard-headed SOB, you know. I still am in many ways, but uh, I stopped resisting that which is, you know. I'm really hard-headed when it comes to fighting the control system and other people's ignorance of it. You know, believe me, I got a whole lot of will when it comes to doing that kind of work. Uh, But I don't resist the laws of nature anymore. I don't resist things that are universal and I cannot change, that I'm just bound by. 
I recognize that. I'm not the highest power in this universe. There are forces that govern my behavioral choices. I have free will. See, that's how natural law works. It works in conjunction with free will. That's the beauty. It doesn't mean that because natural law exists, reality is a prison. That's not what it means. That's what people who have a sick worldview when it comes to the existence of natural law think. They think, well, that means we're all in a prison. We can't do whatever we want without consequence. Yeah, we can't yeah, do whatever I'm we want without... Of, yeah, go ahead. I, 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 it makes mine kind of silly, but I'm reminded of the end of Forrest Gump where he's talking about like the choice and the difference between uh, what are we, like the feather blowing on the wind or do we have free will? And, and it seems as if it's both. It really is both. Yes. Like we have our external conditionalities and, and, and the, the, the situations we're in, and then we also have the free will to um, act within those boundaries. There it is. That's exactly correct. Very, very good understanding of what this is. These are the boundary conditions of the universe, universal boundary conditions that ultimately allow us to do whatever we want, but not without consequence. We behave a certain way, there are consequences. We behave a different way, there are other results, different consequences. That's why people who have had a deep understanding of this in the past have often written about this under the term consequentialism is the philosophy that it's often been referred to. And you could type in that term into a search engine and get lots of results. And if you study consequentialism, it is essentially the same as natural law. Other people have referred to it as karma or karmic law in many Eastern traditions. And in the true sense of karma, not the uh, mystical caste system uh, you know, idea of it that is religiously based, that's not real karma. That's some you know, bunk uh, BS version of karma that justifies uh, continuing a control system. Okay, and but, reincarnation, like just against reincarnation, like you're correct. you're born into one caste, so you right. have to be treated a certain way. So don't dare treat them better. differently because they're receiving their karmic debt from past lives. So let that suffering go on unabated. You know that's nonsense. That's not karma. Karma is the is a result that we get based on, upon how we live our lives, and that's actively happening all the time. It's not just something that happens in future incarnations that we receive. It's happening now. That's how, how natural law is, it is applying to our whole society in the aggregate now, not at some future time. We're living in karmic law. We're living in moral law. We're living in natural law. It's in the pre- actively binding us in the present moment. And again, it, the way you just described it is perfect. It is the boundary conditions that ultimately provide um, uh, limits to what we can do, okay, so uh, without being negatively affected. We break natural law, then there's consequences, because that's the boundary condition. It's, see, what nature did is it, it made, the, this whole place was created, intelligent beings were populated within it, and free will was gifted to those intelligent beings. And we can make a choice to say we're going to understand the limits or the boundary conditions of our behavioral decisions and actions that we put into, a, into effect. And we can live in harmony with these laws of morality, and then we can do whatever we want. Anything that we could possibly dream of can be done. Now, that's not a prison. That's a paradise. That's an amazing set of circumstances that is so elegant and beautiful, it can even barely even be described. Okay, And then creation just basically said, well, hey, there's these boundary conditions out here. You go past this line with your behavioral choices and what you do and how you treat others, and then you start causing harm, then you've got to go into some level of control and bondage until you understand not to behave that way. Okay, And what we even said is... Control as, and bondage even comes down to our own, um, say, for example, if we were to align ourselves with nature in such a way that we build ourselves sustainable housing and have a south-facing greenhouse that will give us a lot more That's uh, right. light into into creating these uh, types of foods in our homes right. versus if we had a, a north-facing one, which is like almost the antithesis to what you really need to, to the situation, right. unless you're in the opposite pole. Like on so the now we're talking about aligning our 
behavior and lifestyle to in harmony with natural forces that exist all around us to ease the things that we need to do in the physical world for this sustenance of life. Absolutely. A sane society would structure its lifestyle in harmony with those forces, or what many people have simply termed nature's wheel work, the mechanisms of nature. Uh, absolutely. That would be part of living in harmony with all of the forces of nature. Um, Rather than going out of ha- harmony with nature where we're overfishing as I mentioned earlier, right. or, or, or like uh, taking animal husbandry to such a degree that right. we're like, destroying our planet. And then you are going against those natural forces and you're creating chaotic conditions that can only exactly. sustain a certain level of imbalance. Once it tips past a certain level of imbalance, you have collapse, which is what we're arriving at. And I mean, when I mean we are arriving at, I mean we are on the very edge of that system of collapse. And when it it goes, it's going to be like a huge Antarctic ice shelf being broken off. And it's going to go all at once. And it's going to be painful because nature is constantly trying to tell us the right thing, the right way to go, the right way to behave for our optimum benefit. Again, I want to stress natural law is not a punishment mechanism. Natural law is there to provide guidance and boundary conditions for our optimum benefit and efficiency in this world, in this life, in this uh, construct called the universe that we exist in to learn and grow in consciousness. It is not there to to hold us back. It is not there to uh, put us in, in some kind of a cage. It is there to actually show us the most direct route to freedom. Okay? So... Um, to go it back really to, is too, because these types of sustainable ideas, that those like ideas that these projects suggest, are all things that we would need to have within, say, a starship or whatever to get us off this planet anyway. So sure. it, even if we had, it, 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 assuming that we had warp drive tomorrow, uh, by by Saturday we could be on another planet, and and but we need these technologies to keep us alive during that time. Like we, we right. need these types of um, that's the freedom that it could definitely lead to a level of freedom that like sure. brings us within the boundaries of, of nature as well as allows us to explore outer space. And that, that's why the community of beings that may be out there, they're not going to welcome us with open arms if we try to go out into the cosmos in the level of consciousness that we're currently at. Not, not even yeah. close. You know? <laughs> yeah, trying to dig up like, a, like I've heard about like this one planet where it's perfectly out there it's like uh, like something like 99% diamond or something. And something as ridiculous as that, like people wanting to go out and try and like just go mine everything and steal all these resources. Right. It's not really the type of like, we can't be like ravenous wolves to the rest of the universe, but either right. the way we ravaged our own planet. Yeah, and they'll claim that that's all theirs. No one else can have any access to it. It all belongs to me, more than I could ever possibly need or use in, in 10 lifetimes, in 100 lifetimes, you know? Right, the guy Which, the, that's those. not ownership. Yeah. That's not property. You know, I have to make that so clear. You know, we, I want to get into what property is, what it's not. You know, we'll build up to that. Um, the guy from touch Pico, on specifically, he what he talked about in this one movie called The One Percent, like uh, Jamie Johnson, one of the Johnson, oh, yes. Johnson family. Yeah, good, he, good, good movie. He interviewed good, good yeah, documentary. He, yeah, he interviewed the guy from Kinkos and the guy and he that created it, and he said, "Oh yeah, one day I want to be up on the moon and I want to look down on the earth and say and say that's, that's mine." Part yeah. of part of my portfolio <laughs> not yeah that that was the psychotic part that i felt like oh, it's bad enough boy. You, you want to own the whole planet but when you're saying that's part of your portfolio now, that's wow that's <laughs> mental illness yes, that's exactly. mental illness that has yeah. nothing to do with legitimacy of property that is mental illness and see Again, I want to clearly delineate when we get into the topic of property, what is the real thing and what is something that goes into illusory realms in the mind that is part of an imbalanced psyche when it comes to what property is. But I just want to clarify one more point about natural law. It is the deterministic component within creation. See, uh, there's this big battle between the the left-brain folks who – 
uh, often think everything's random and chaotic and it's all just, you know, some type of a strange process, okay, that happened for no purpose or reason. You know, when we look at the origins of the cosmos, that's how most scientists, scientists think of creation, the whole process. It was just a grand accident. And there's, there's no creator, therefore there can't be any real underlying intelligence in nature. And there's no such thing as a- actual spirit. There's certainly no such thing as natural or moral law that governs behavior. And, you know, since creation was a cosmic accident, existence can't really have any true purpose or meaning other than to continue to exist and survive. So these are all the hallmarks of left brain imbalance, scientism, atheism, and it ultimately leads to government being the highest form of, you know, man being the highest form, therefore governments are legitimate, and it goes into totalitarian control mechanisms at some point. And when you go into deep levels of imbalance toward that worldview, and I would call that worldview the randomness worldview. It's a very left brain imbalance worldview. Then the right brain imbalance worldview is like what you might call the religionist or the religious extremist worldview. Okay? Well, God controls everything. There's no, nothing he doesn't know or set into motion, and you know, all occurrences in existence are preordained. Therefore, free will doesn't exist. Free will is an illusion, you know. Uh, you don't bother to try to change your behavior or change anything in this world because it's already set in stone. It's already prophesied. It's already, you know, it, it's already predetermined. And action then becomes meaningless. Why bother to take any action? That's meaningless. And these are, again, the hallmarks of right brain imbalance, religious extremism, and that's the, the sick worldview called determinism. Now, when we understand that truth is somewhere between these opposite extremes, we see that it's actually a combination of a – it has a deterministic component and a random component. That deterministic component – and again, these two things work in synthesis. They blend together, and then there's a synthetic – a synthesis relationship between them that ultimately makes things occur. That, that's how – uh, we are actually co-creating our experience with the force of natural law, with the, these natural laws that govern the consequences of behavior. They are the deterministic component of creation, those laws of morality. Then there's a random component to the co-creative process, and that, of course, is free will. We have free will, but th- and that's the random component. We can choose whatever we want to do, but not without consequence. That's the deterministic component. Natural law is the boundary conditions for our free will behavioral decisions. So with that, with that being said, as a laying the, the framework, the groundwork for natural law, let's talk about what natural law actually is. It, understanding natural law means that you have actually born conscience in yourself. Conscience is truly born when you deeply understand natural law. And what conscience is, is knowledge, okay? And once again, this has nothing to do with belief. There's no belief system involved. This is a science. This is a true science, natural law. It's a lost science, and it's a science that has been over the many years shrouded in mysticism. But what I'm trying to do is completely demystify this lost science to help people to understand the causal factors of what is happening why we are creating in completely chaotic ways here on earth on, at an unconscious level even. And if we understand these laws, we can create in a conscious way, co-create with these laws in a conscious way and then get orderly results. Okay. Which is what we say we all want. We want order. We want peace. We want freedom. We want prosperity, etc. But the things that we're doing with our behaviors don't align with those goals. And it, until we do align our behaviors with these laws, those goals are unattainable. They cannot be achieved. They can yeah. only be achieved once we understand these laws and act in accordance with them. That what do okay? Understanding these laws means that you now have developed conscience, which is knowledge. And people will think, isn't conscience action? No, it is not. The exercise of conscience is action. That's putting what you know into effect through your behaviors. That's exercising conscience. Well, then what is conscience? Conscience is knowledge. And it's, think about it. The word science is in conscience. 
con science, okay? The prefix con in Latin means together or with or common to, common to everyone, okay? And then science means to know or to understand from the Latin skio, skio skiere. Skiere is, skio would be the first person present tense form of the verb to know or to understand. Skiere is the infinitive, to know, to understand in Latin. So that's where the word science comes from, okay? Skio skiere in Latin, to know, to understand. We get the word science from it. We combine that with the prefix con meaning together, and it means to know or to understand altogether. Common knowledge, common sense knowledge is what conscience actually means, literally, from its etymological roots. And then once, well, what is the knowledge then? What is conscience the knowledge of? It is the knowledge of the definitive and objective difference between right behavior and wrong behavior, right action and wrong action. That there is an objective difference between those two modes of behavior. And I tell people that the, these, this knowledge exists in nature, co conscience, right and wrong. It exists in nature, and they say, well, how is that possible? Well, if there's laws that govern the difference between the, between the choices of right and wrong, would it matter if any human beings were present? Those laws would have to exist in nature first. Okay, those laws were created by creation, by the universe. So gravity, do human beings have to exist for gravity to exist? Does any matter even need to exist? Matter needs to exist for gravity to be experienced, just like human beings would need to exist for natural law, moral law to be experienced. But for it to exist, it exists in nature because it's a law that is made by creation itself very difficult thing for many people to accept, except, um, especially people who are very much in a left-brain mindset and in a scientism-based mindset. But just ask yourself the question, if the earth were suddenly gone, that doesn't mean gravity would not be in existence in the fabric of nature, in the field of energy that is the, the natural world, it would still exist. That's why I tell people, the laws of right and wrong exist in the fabric of creation. It doesn't matter if human beings were gone. Those laws would still be there. They would still be present. Okay? Just as, as gravity or electromagnetic laws would still be present, even if there were no matter for them to operate upon. Those laws are embedded in creation itself, in the process of creation, in the underlying intelligence of creation. <coughs> so, again... The knowledge of the difference between right and wrong is what conscience is. Then exercising that conscience m means you're going to willfully, through your free will choice, choose right action over wrong action. That is the exercise of conscience. Not exercising conscience means you're going to choose wrong action over right action. It's failure to exercise the knowledge of right versus wrong. And right and wrong are objective. <laughs> subjective or based on interpretation they actually exist independently of um, human perception so let me explain what I mean by this okay it's not a human perception when harm is caused to another being it's a real event that occurs in the physical reality in nature okay when something happens in nature that is harmful a being suffers as a result that there's no interpretation when it comes to that. In other words, if I walk outside my door here in Philadelphia and I wait for the first person to walk down the street in front of my uh, front steps, in front of my house, and I step off the front step of my home and I wield the left hook with all my weight at that person's jaw for absolutely no reason just because I felt like doing it, okay? That is an objective act of moral wrong behavior, morally wrong behavior, or just immoral behavior, okay? <clears throat> There's a reason for that. I caused harm to something I don't own. That, bo that body is someone, some other consciousness, aspect of consciousness is property, okay? 
Someone else owns that. I don't own that body. I'm not inhabiting that body. I'm not stewarding that body. So therefore, I attacked someone else's property. I caused it harm. There is physical result of harm when I perform that action. Therefore, it's an immoral behavior, or it is simply wrong. So the definition of wrong is that which is incorrect and not based in truth. And when you act upon it, it results in harm. When you actions that are based in wrong, in the wrong modality of behavior, always result in harm to other beings. Always. Therefore, that which is wrong is that which is immoral, is that which is in opposition to natural law. Now, we have to start with that negative definition, with, with the definition of the thing that is the opposite of right, because you can't define right in the affirmative. You can only define right in that which it is not, or what you could call the apophatic definition, A-P-O-P-H-A-T-I-C, apophatic definition of what a right is. And this is why many people do not understand what rights are, which is why we're losing them as a species. A right is an action that, when you take it, does not result in harm to another sentient being. So notice, I've defined it in the negative. I've said what a right is not. A right is an action that does not cause harm to others. Defining it in the negative sense. It is that which is correct, based in truth, moral, and in harmony with the laws of morality, of, of natural law. Very much a no victim, no crime mentality. If harm is not caused to another as a result of the behavior, then you have a right to do it. Period. Okay? If harm is caused, you have no right to perform that action. Very simple common sense. Demystified. Now, then we have to say, well, what actions constitute harm? Because you need clarification. What is a harmful behavior? What is a harmful action? So then, to understand what rights are, we could go on and list rights forever in a day. You know, there's a billion, a, a quadrillion rights, more, infinite amount of rights. There's an infinite amount of actions that don't cause harm, but there's a very specific set of behaviors that do cause harm. And it's actually a very small number of behaviors that cause harm. Very small number of behaviors. You know, the, all the different kinds of harm and wrongdoing you could possibly list generally fall under a simple category of actions. Wrongdoings, natural law transgressions, I call them. Okay? Simple, harmful actions. Murder, assault, rape, theft, trespass, and coercion. I'll say them one more time. Murder, assault, rape, theft, trespass, coercion. Okay? I like the way you put it actually in your one uh, in your seminar with like how each of them even can almost be boiled down into a theft of sort. Such as uh, right. in, in the last show we we talked about how uh, rape would be a theft of one's personal choices to who they want to associate with on a sexual level and so on. Correct. So just let's go through them one at a time then. I mean, you know, let's look at murder. Right? Is murder theft? Is it a form of theft? Yes, yeah, a theft of someone's For life. Sure. Taking a life that isn't yours. That, is that someone else's life force? You just put that it is. You know? So therefore, murder is, is a form of theft. You're stealing life that isn't your property, that isn't yours. That's someone else's life force. Okay? Yeah. You're Assault. stealing someone's mental, or you're stealing someone's physical well-being when it comes to assault. Right. Someone has a right to remain unharmed in their body, which is their property. So if you go start, so if what I did... The, the hypothetical scenario I laid out, I go outside, wait for the first person to walk by and, and crack them in the jaw, okay? That's called assault. Why? Because I did harm to someone else's bodily property, their body, that I don't own. That's not my property. Okay? So that's theft of someone's uh, well-being in their own property called their body. Therefore, I don't have that right. That's a harmful action. It's a wrongdoing. Great. Again, you already said it. It's the stealing of someone else's free will association to choose to sexually associate with whom they, they, they will, with, with whom they choose. That's a form of coercion, but it's a form of theft. 
You're stealing someone's free will. And you're also harming their body. You know, so that's a double form of theft. <laughs> that, you know, yeah, I even mentioned violence. further that like it could be it, it would also it could also be considered a, a robbery of their mental well being in the future as well as this psychological attack is that's correct. stuck with them. You you are thieving their psychological well being as well, their emotional well being, which you don't have a right exactly. to do. Um then Theft itself is the taking of physical property that someone is in, <clears throat> currently in rightful stewardship of and using. <clears throat> so I, I'll, I'll get into even in a natural law-based resource economy, property of physical items will still exist, and you don't have a right to just go and say, hey, you're using this computer, you have all your data on it, I'm just taking it because there's no, no money. So I'm just taking the computer you're ha- you happen to be using. You know, that still would be theft. So exactly. If someone can... owns something for, for whatever it was, it's one thing to uh, that we that the idea of the natural resource based economy natural law resource based economy is out to create an abundance of access for everyone right. to use what they want. Yes. It is very different from the idea of you just walking into someone's house and say, I want your couch, get up. That is correct. I'm taking the couch. <laughs> it's just that Absolutely. that is still a theft. That is still something that would not be uh, allowed, or or would even be something that like would be something that you have the right to self defense with a resource based economy. Of course, of course, a very very good understanding of that. Trespass. This is taking someone's security in their own lair, in the living space or niche that they've carved out for themselves. Okay, you don't just go and run into somebody's living space again, even in a natural law resource-based economy, natural law-based resource-based economy. You still wouldn't just go and say, oh, uh, this person happens to be uh, staying in, the, in this particular area with you know, the other members of his community. Let me just go in and raid that place and go where, where I'm, I may not be welcome presently. You know? That would still be an invasion of someone else's space, their living space. So that's called trespass. What you're doing is you're stealing someone else's security. The, their comfort and well-being in the moment to, to not worry about bodily harm possibly being done to them. So trespass is also a natural law wrong, wrongdoing or transgression. You're taking someone else's sense of security in their own lair, which is also a wrong. Then coercion, and, and all of these are forms of coercion. You know, coercion, you could also say, is also a very baseline level of, of natural law wrongdoing. You know, making someone do something they don't want to do or forcing them to do something or forcing something upon them. That's thieving free will, which is also not yours to take. That's the gift of the the whole universe upon sentient beings. And no one has a right to take that from someone else and make them into a slave by coercing them to do certain behaviors or make them not do other behaviors that they have a right to do. So coercion is also theft. So I challenge anybody to come up with a form of a wrongful behavior that isn't a form of theft because you won't be able to do it. People will say, yeah, the closest one I found was um, whenever we engage in consumption or production patterns, which take more than we need, we are engaging in violence at that point as well. But but are we Uh, not then stealing something that someone else requires because we cannot use it? We cannot actually use it. That's not property then. See, this is the, the be boundary be line the between real way. right. The boundary line between real property and the illusory definition of property is real property means you're in stewardship, lawful stewardship of it, lawful possession of it, and you're actively using it. You're using what you can use. <clears throat> property isn't saying I'm going to own all the salt in the whole state of Pennsylvania by myself. All of it that exists belongs to me. That's not a legitimate claim of property. Property is, I own the salt and the salt shaker on my table because that's what I can use right now. And I probably can't use it all right now. Okay? It's not, I'm going to hold back all the natural resources of the world from other people that also require those, those resources and substances for daily life. That's not property. But I'll get into that in a, in a deeper way as we move forward. But let's stick on this idea of the natural law wrongdoings for a minute as forms of theft. 
every single natural law transgression or harmful action that a human being is even capable of taking all boils down to a form of theft. You could even say lying is a form of theft because you're withholding the truth, which is someone's birthright, to know to make accurate information available to make accurate decisions, I should say, and then put out uh, um, quality behavior. If, you ha- if you're being lied to and deceived and you don't have accurate information, you're, you, don't, you don't have what you require to make good quality decisions regarding what you should do and how you should behave. So uh, lying is a form of theft through withholding accurate information willfully from other people. So you could add even lying, consciously lying, willfully lying to that chart as well, to that list. So the key thing to keep in mind here is all wrongdoings are a form of theft. No one will be able to come up with a form of wrongdoing that is not a form of theft. I've put that challenge out there now for actually a couple of years. No one has been able to do it successfully. Yeah, even when, even when you're like a business is, damages the environment, uh, it still is a theft of the reduction of the – it's a theft of the carrying capacity of the earth. That's right. what it comes down to. It's also a theft of someone else's ability to live in a, um, in a balanced way upon the earth and to, and, to, and to maintain good health on the earth because the damage to the economy, to the ecology is damage to human health. It's in an indirect capacity. It's not as direct as hitting someone in the head with a hammer, granted. But over time, that is manifesting as direct harm to other human beings' health, which isn't yours to take. So yes, so it's not even just human so beings as well. It's also like businesses when, like, uh, say, um, the 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 BP and and the sure. Gulf of Mexico, sure, and like all those fish and all those pelicans yep. and every other right. little the animals pet. as well. Yes, exactly. All things we don't have a right to do. Uh, you know, I, I'd like people to understand it at a very individual level first, and when they understand natural law at the individual level of behavior, then you could scale back and see, my God, what are we doing to the earth? What are we doing to the other animals? First of all, what are we doing to the earth? The thing that, that operates as the carrying capacity for all this life, you know, what are we doing, you know? But I think the reason so many people are blind to that is because they're not even looking at natural law from an individuated perspective of, of behavioral decisions. First and foremost, what we do in the, our daily lives with other people first, then extend that and then look at what do we do to animals. My God, you look at that rabbit hole. It's horrific. And then what are we doing to the earth itself, you know, which is a live organism. The earth is not some dead thing. It's a live living dynamic system. How can life come from something that's not alive? Of course the earth is a living being. You know? The whole universe is a living being. So to, to go back to the natural law wrongdoings, they're all forms of theft. And that brings us to the key, the absolute key when it comes to understanding natural law, the understanding of what is truly property. Okay? Some form of property is always being stolen. When any wrongdoing, when any behavioral wrong action is committed. So we could look at physical property and talk about theft, what that is, okay? But then you could look at taking someone's life. Life is a form of property. We already talked about that in, in murder as, as a natural law wrongdoing. Rights, your rights, the, the actions that you can perform because they don't cause harm to others. That's your property. That's your birthright. That's why it's called a birthright. You're gifted with the free will to perform those behaviors unchallenged. That's the definition of a right. It doesn't cause harm. Therefore, you may do it. Okay? That's property. That's my right. Okay? Nobody has a right to stop me from doing those things. And that's also what man's law is about, stopping people from exercising rights that do exist. Are in many cases, are what man's law is doing, like prohibition, you know, and then coercing them to do things that the other people tell you you must do, like taxation. Get, you know, you must turn over a certain arbitrarily de- uh, chosen amount of the product of your labor. Otherwise, we're going to come and do bodily harm to you or throw you in a cage. Okay, so rights are a form of property. Freedom is a form of property. No one has a right to take someone else's freedom when they have not caused harm to someone else whether their, their, bod- their freedom of movement or, or do bodily harm to them when they've done nothing but exercise a right. 
Okay? So all of these things are forms of property. And there's such a thing as true property, and then there's the bastardization of the term property, and it's not property at all. Okay? So we have to clearly delineate between what we own and what we don't own. What does ownership mean? What does it mean to own a thing? Okay? So if all wrongdoings come down to theft, some form of property must be taken. A living being or their property must have been taken, harmed, or defrauded in some form or fashion for a violation of natural law or a wrongdoing to have taken place. I feel like we're at the moment where I want to throw in this quote by uh, Pierre-Joseph Prodhoom. And he, okay. was, uh, he uh, wrote a book in, uh, in 1840 called What is Property or an Inquiry of the Principle of Right and of Government? And it's essentially he's speaking not really about, again, your average person of what they own, but he's talking about like businesses or nations right. trying to own something. And his sure. quote is, if I were asked to answer the following question, what is slavery? And I should answer in one word, it is murder. My meaning would be understood at once. No extended argument would be required. Why right. then, to this other question, what is property, may I not likewise say it is robbery without the certainty of being misunderstood? The second proposition being no other than the transformation of the first. So essentially what he's suggesting is, is that, like, um, I guess you could put it almost in, the, in like, the mark concept where he had mentioned about how like every square inch of this planet at one time or another is stolen by Yeah, it's claimed to be owned by someone, right. Exactly. Exactly. So there, there's very much the difference that I want to point out here in, in like I said, the Venus Project quote unquote wanting to, 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 to um, make a um, heretic um, and, and a, a worldwide inheritance that the, the, the globe can be put under versus the theft, the outright theft of land that was taken from, say, right. the Native Americans in the, the 1700s. And, and this, is, this is the clear delineation that must be made when it comes to what property is and what it is not. When you say the word, many people of a more right-brain-oriented bent will think of it as there's no such thing. Property doesn't exist. It's a, it's a very, I almost look at that as a big new age deception, okay, that there's no such thing as property. Um, that's an imbalanced worldview uh, because I think what they're doing, what people like that are often doing is they are associating the purely egoic, left brain, out of control, dominator, taker mentality with the word property, the concept of legitimate property is not that left brain, e egotistical, ego out of control, you know, taker, dominator worldview of property, which is I'm going to own it all. I'm going to own it all no matter if anybody else doesn't have any. And I, I have a right to do that, you know. Don't you know? I, I, I can own every single resource, and nobody else can have any of this. It's all mine, even though I could never – me and my family could never possibly use it all in 100 lifetimes, but it's still all ours. It's mine. It's ours. That's called ego out of control, completely imbalanced, left brain out of control ideology. And that has nothing to do with the le legitimate form of property, okay? Right now, I'm speaking to you on a computer. My information's on, on this computer. My slides are on this computer. My personal data is on, on this computer. I am in stewardship of this computer. I maintain it. I am responsible for it. I use it on a day-to-day -day basis. It is my property, not illusorily my property. I own this computer. If someone tried to come and take this computer and claim it as their own, they would be stealing. That would be theft because I'm – see, there's qualities to property. There's, something makes something legitimately property, okay? The thing that makes something legitimately property, there's – we, we can look at the concept of ownership. And, you know, again, real right brain people say you can't ever own anything. You're, you're going to die. You're an impermanent being. So don't tell me you own anything. That's bull. Okay? Well, you know what? It's not. It's not. It's, it's legitimate and it exists in nature. Okay? I'm not claiming I could own something for eternity. Never did. I claim I can own something for a time. While I, I am in physical incarnation, in a physical body. 
okay? I own my body, first and foremost, okay? And there's a reason. There are reasons that I own my body. It's not just a claim. There's things that are taking place in the natural world, in the physical world, the manifested reality, that prove that I am in ownership of my body, okay? So we have to look at the qualities of ownership. To own a thing means something specifically. It means that you are in rightful owner possession, rightful possession, okay? You're holding this thing. You are have it in your stewardship, in your own, in your possession, rightfully, meaning you didn't harm somebody to do it. And that's where we get the difference between rightful possession and the claim of possession. So, again, you can go back to the example. Um, uh, I own all grown food in the state of Pennsylvania, no matter who grows it. That's not a rightful claim. That's not, a, that's not rightful possession. If I take seeds, plant them in my backyard, grow some food for my own consumption and the consumption of my own family during the course of a couple of months' time, I own that food, okay? Yeah, the earth produced it. I did the work to uh, put that, those conditions into effect that, that help that natural process along and help that grow, and it's enough that I can use it in a certain amount of time. Now, if I went onto a factory farm system and grew like 100 acres of carrots that I couldn't possibly use before they rotted, I'm not going to say all of this belongs to me, you know, even if they're starving people. And I couldn't use it in forever, okay? It's not a rightful claim of possession because you have to be able to use the thing, okay? So, in other words, when people say, well, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to be the owner of all of these resources in any particular area, like, again, the so-called mining rights, Okay, I own every single natural resource that uh, comes out of this mine. Okay, well, it's it's metal that this area, uh, metal comes out of this whole area of the country from the this mine. I own it. Anybody that wants to use metal for anything has to come through me to obtain that resource. Is that a rightful claim of ownership of property? It, it's not. It's saying no matter how much I can't use the stuff that is. Separate from what I can use that is left over still belongs to me. Okay? That's, that's improper control of usage. That's the second form of quality of ownership. Okay? To own something means you are in rightful possession, and you're controlling the usage of the thing, but you can use it. See, you're con- I'm controlling the usage of this computer because it is the computer I use on a day-to-day basis. So, therefore, I use it, and that's my, my property, and somebody can't come up and just take it, okay? If I grew 100 acres of lettuce, and I could only eat a, a head of lettuce a day, okay, I can't say nobody else who is re- requiring food in that vicinity that has no other food can just go and take a couple heads of lettuce for their usage. To, to hold that back from someone that is in need of it at a particular time when I can't use it is not a legitimate rightful claim of possession or property. Okay? The control so like to, of use. I guess I'd like to ask uh, then, like, um, Forbes put out this article about this super entity that's literally about the 147 major companies that control all about 60, 70% of the major resources that our world And and did you see the article that came out that about 80 individuals own over 50% of the entire world's resources and wealth? 80? Exactly. And that's what I was just about to get to. One of the next articles that Forbes put out was that um, there's then four companies that own those 147 companies. So we're almost not that far away from what that guy from Kinko's was after anyway. Owning the earth. I'm going to own the earth. Yeah, and that's legitimate. That's lawful, yeah. quote unquote. See, that's yeah. again man that yeah. concept of ownership. Na- ownership exists in natural law, but that's not what it is. What you've just described there—that's sickness. That's mental illness. Wanting to have it all and 
have it cut off from everybody else has nothing to do with legitimate ownership or property. Okay, so just wrapping up this concept. Ownership is rightful possession, the control of usage in a way that you can use the, the resources, okay, and a responsibility for that thing or those, those things. So the reason I own my body, let's start with that, okay? I own my body because I'm in rightful possession of it, okay? Did I kill somebody to uh, incarnate and uh, inhabit this physical vehicle called the body? No. I'm in rightful possession of it. It's my birthright. I was born with this body, okay? Two, do I control the usage of this body? Do I, do I have free will to decide what my behaviors with this body will, will, will be? Yes, I do. So I control its usage, okay? No one else controls the usage of my body, not legitimately. They may claim that they control how I'm going to use my body, but not leg- that's not a legitimate claim because they don't own it. I do. And am I responsible for my body? Well, yeah, I have the ability to respond to situations and circumstances, and I take personal responsibility to know the difference between right and wrong behavior and to choose the actions that are in alignment with right action and to not choose behaviors that are in alignment with wrong action. I'm responsible for what I do. Whether I choose right or wrong, I'm still responsible. Okay? So I'm in rightful possession, I control its usage, and I'm responsible for it. That means in nature, not a conceptual idea that only exists in man's mind. In nature, I own that thing. In this case, my body. And therefore, I get to decide what happens with it. That's another part of ownership. Again, that's control of usage. So I put into my body what I want to put into it. I just put into my body a nice big juice of, uh, you know, freshly augered juice, uh, a carrot cantaloupe mixture. It's been one of my favorites recently. Why am I allowed to put that into my body? Because I own my body. It's my property. Okay? And if I want to tote up with a, with a, uh, a marijuana a cigarette or vaporizer later, that is my right to do so because I own my body. And therefore, I get I'm to actually talk. reminded of our con, uh, of our conditionality stuff that we were talking about earlier. Because if I'm not mistaken, you're drinking those juices to alter your body's conditions. That's right. That's correct. And so far, it's been going really well. I mean, you know, I, I'm doing what doctors are telling me is so-called impossible. You know, controlling blood sugar levels uh, with a type of diabetes that they say is permanent insulin dependence which is a, a big crock, quite frankly. These doctors obviously don't know what they're talking about because I'm clearly doing it. <laughs> you know, my blood sugar levels are totally normal, you know, which they say is impossible. Oh, I drink this glass of juice, and oh, it has lots of natural sugars in it. That should spike my blood sugar. Well, it, it doesn't do that because I, I, I did a juice fast for, for a time, and now my blood sugar is being regulated naturally by my pancreas, which they say was never going to produce insulin again. You know, so doctors don't, aren't necessarily in alignment with what is. You know, they have their specialized forms of indoctrinated so-called knowledge that they stick to like a script, like a religion. And, you know, if they, data comes along that conflicts with their religion, they say, oh, it can't be possible. You know, well, whatever. Uh, you keep thinking that. I'll keep doing what I'm doing. Thanks. This is work. Yeah, my wife had been went through the same thing when she was pregnant. We went into the, 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 to the hospital at one point for one of the wake up checkups. The doctor took a look at her and he was just like scratching his head like he couldn't find anything wrong with her. So How like that he be literally fun? went, yeah, exactly. He literally went out into the other room and got another doctor to come in and take a look at her on top again. And and neither one of them could find anything wrong with her. So we were like, okay, have a nice day. He must have like, stated it. He mu- it mu- must have never, never occurred, you know? <laughs> I mean, I mean, people have cured things with natural, a bit, uh, 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 natural cures, and uh, doctors are so left brain imbalanced that some of them have said it was misdiagnosed, and that was never the thing in the first place. See, uh, that that'll be the thing. My blood sugar might stay le- uh, totally within ne- normal parameters after do- doing this change in lifestyle, and uh, a doctor will come along and say oh, you probably just never had diabetes to begin with. It was just inaccurately diagnosed. Yeah, because uh, uh, blood sugar that was uh, in, uh, you know, keto, I was in ketoacidosis and my blood sugar was like 600 ketones in the urine. That doesn't mean you have diabetes, you know. Uh, That's about as extreme of uh, a diabetic condition as possible. You're really doing damage to your internal organs and uh, 
kidneys at that point and heart probably. Um, so, you know, uh, th- they'll say, oh, you, you since uh, your insulin is, is actually regulating your blood sugar now, and that is impossible with the type of diabetes you had, uh, it ha- will have to be ha- had to have been a, di- a misdiagnosis. That's what some of them will say because they can't say that they're wrong. That's what the ego is. The inability to admit that you're wrong about something, you know, and uh, it's a whole. And when you find grief comes to that point right. where you can admit that you're wrong about something, it, it, ca- it can cause that cognitive dissonance until you finally figure out where the truth actually lies. Where until you right. align yourself with the truth. That's right. And and again, that's what many people who still refuse to understand natural law haven't gone to that place of saying, you know, I'm wrong about this. There is something. Look. Laws govern everything. Even these scientifically minded folks out there, you know, these scientismly minded folks, I should say, there's nothing wrong with real science. There is something wrong with scientism, which is what I would call government funded um, so- pseudoscience religion about uh, maintaining a paradigm about how the world actually is, about how situations in nature actually are that's not real science that's what i call scientism it's a religion and it, it's nothing different from other or organized extreme forms of religion nothing it's just a different form of brain imbalance uh religious extremism comes from right brain imbalance and scientism extremism comes from left brain imbalance neither one of those is anywhere remotely close to what's true you know it's just a religion just it's you know we call it science, but it's pseudoscience and it's a, a form of a religion. So, um, you know, many people will refuse to admit that they're they've been wrong about the existence of natural law. That and they have a hard time coming around to saying that yes, natural law exists because then that implies there's a higher power than man. See, that's what people of a very left brain bent want to believe. There's nothing in the universe that is higher than man. And that essentially makes us God. That makes us be allowed to do whatever we want without consequence. I don't care if people have a problem with the term God. Then don't call it that if you have a problem with it. Call it the underlying intelligence inherent to all all of nature, whatever. Okay? The conditionalities of the universe. There you go. The boundary conditions that underlie the whole universe. That's as good a definition of God as any other. Hey, you, you don't like the word God? Call it law with a capital L. You know, that's what God really is. It's the laws that govern everything here in this construct for experience and growth of consciousness. That's what, like that's what the creator is. Or, or, or like when you, earlier when you were talking about the law of gravity and so on. Right. Yeah, we'll put those laws into effect. We'll put the natural laws into effect. You know, what started the whole process of creation to begin with. You know, if that, you could call it the, the primal cause. You know, that has no preceding cause. It's that which is. It's consciousness, you know. It's it's energy. It's the, it's the root of everything. It's it's life. It's life force energy, which is what consciousness ultimately is, and that's everything. Everything's made of that. There's nothing that can't be made of that. Okay, nothing can stop being that. It's just that which is. It's a very very difficult thing for people of a very left brain nature to re- uh, mindset condition to wrestle with. Um, so. <clears throat> People think there's laws that govern all this other physical stuff and matter, but it doesn't govern behavior. Now, the human behavior is exempt from all the laws of nature. The only thing in creation that's exempt from it is human beings. Yeah, okay, yeah, sure. We're just that special. We're just that privileged that we're exempt from all laws. Nothing governs our behavior. It governs every other single physical object in creation, but it doesn't govern human beings. Right. Oh, okay, hey, fine. <laughs> it's our egos believe- that, that, that have like, yeah. believed in this nonsense for so long through like 2,000 years of un, uh, un, un like questioned dominator patriarchal. patriarchal. Right. Yeah, people are free to believe that. <laughs> hey, lo- lo- like has been said, uh, you're, you're, you have free will to ignore reality, but not without consequence. There will be negative consequences for the ignorance of reality, period, the end, get over it. That's how nature works. It, it's, a, it's a very – another thing I want to clarify about natural law before we continue is it's a very impersonal thing. I keep trying to bring this up to people because whenever you talk about this, people say, well, this sounds like you know, the, uh, 
uh, you know, vengeful God hypothesis. He's, we're going to be punished for what we do. No, we're creating that. Nobody's punishing us. It's just us doing that to ourselves. It's yeah, in one of the zeitgeist films, they specifically mention that nature is a dictatorship, whether we like it or not. And yeah. if, we, if, if we don't live within those boundaries of, the, of those natural conditions of, of our universe, we could definitely imbalance our current situation and make right. sure that the Earth can't support as many people and that the carrying capacity could be reduced. And that sort of damage to us. Absolutely. To, to the world is that it is happening currently because we are not living within these proper parameters. And I, I, I want to say something that's going to sound strange, okay? But you are living in a computer. We live in a computer. The universe is a computer. Not, it's not like a computer. It is a computer. Literally, it computes. The universe computes, okay? And when you program something into a computer, right, and you get a specific result on the screen. Is that personal? Did the computer go, I love you. Thank you so much for inputting that wonderful code. Here's the lovely result that I'm going to generate for you because I care so much. Is that what a, compu- is that what a computer does? No. The computer doesn't care what you put into it. What you put into it is directly dictating based on how the computer functions, what you're going to get out on the other end and, and of the output, on the screen or on the printer or on the Internet, okay? It doesn't care whether your coding is bad. It doesn't care whether your coding is good. If your coding is good, the program behaves the way it should. You get the predicted output that is efficient, that works right, that does what you want it to do, that takes you where you want to go, that creates what you want to create. You know, it, it, just, it just does that. You know, that's how natural law works. Now, does the computer say to you when you program bad code into the programming language, you compile that program, you build the program for the platform you're on, you execute it, you run it, and the program launches and it's all gibberish. Is that the computer saying, hey, I really can't stand you, you know, I hate you, and I'm going to throw up this horrible, horrible, chaotic stuff because, you know, uh, you're an idiot and you can't do anything right. No, the computer doesn't care. You just put in bad code. It's nothing personal. It just said, well, here's what you put in, and based on how I work, here, I have to put this out onto the screen. I don't have a choice. The universe doesn't have free will like that. It's just doing what it's programmed to do. It's nothing personal. It's an impersonal force is what natural law is, and this is what right brain and people Right brain imbalanced people have a big problem with. They want to think the universe loves and cares about all the individuals regardless of how bad their choices are. It doesn't. The the universe doesn't care about all the individuals even if their choices are in perfect harmony with natural law. The universe doesn't care what you do. It's it's not – doesn't have a personal attachment to the behavioral choices that you make. But it is always – flawlessly at every time, at every place, 100% of the time, going to provide the output based on the programming that you input. It is a computer program. You're living in a holographic, fractal computer program that is more advanced than any other computer in the universe because it is the universe. That is what the universe is. It is a giant computer. What we put into it is the programming language, the source code, the code, however you want to look at it, and then it comes back to us on the screen, the output called our life circumstances. And that algorithm is already pre-programmed. That algorithm is called natural law consequence. And it is governed by an algorithm that always works flawlessly. What we put in is directly determining what we get out. Garbage goes in, garbage comes out. Quality programming through behavior goes in quality life experience comes out on the screen of life it's but nothing to say, as I mentioned earlier uh, okay. the respect existence or expect resistance that's right that's exactly right you know and we have to develop that respect from within ourselves because we're currently in a state of deep self-loathing as a species and we're not 
exercising personal responsibility to know the difference between right and wrong and then choose right action over wrong action. We're trying to advocate that responsibility to other people that we call government you know, and believe we could somehow magically be free when we're not acting in a moral capacity and we're leaving important decisions about moral or immoral behavior up to a group or entity to do that for us and then dictate our behavior, you know. You know, this whole idea that we can abdicate our personal responsibility is the reason that we're going into a prison. There's a law in natural law. I, call, I refer to it as the law of freedom, okay? That's just my name for it. As morality in a society increases, meaning the, the understanding the, of the the objective difference between right action and wrong action, and then that the members of that society willfully exercise that conscience, and they choose the right action over the wrong action willfully because they know the difference between those two modes of behavior. As a society does that more and more in the aggregate, that society in the aggregate becomes freer and freer and freer. Conversely, as a society, as its members in the aggregate, uh, exercise less and less moral decisions and become more and more immoral of a people, they become further and further and further enslaved. They go deeper and deeper into slavery and bondage. It's called the law of freedom. It's a, it's a mathematical equation. You know, Like the universe is a computer, the laws that govern it are just mathematical algorithms. So you can write on one side of the equation, okay, <clears throat> morality, that's the left-hand side of the equation. And then you put the proportional to symbol. The proportional to symbol. Morality is proportional to freedom. And you can reverse them. Freedom is propor directly proportional to morality. At, meaning as one goes up, the other goes up. As one goes down, the other goes down. Invariably, unwaveringly. It's an eternal law of nature. And this is what has been left out of much of the so-called truth and freedom movement, I call them the my truth movement and the my freedom movement, because they're leaving out natural law. It's, it's something very few researchers are even discussing or talking about because most of these people are still at too much of a either left brain bent and don't believe natural law exists or they're on too much of a right brain bent and just believe in certain religious ideologies that really don't have natural law included you know they're also based on likes whims and preferences and rigid dogmatic programming through you know flawed scriptural scriptural ideas of man this isn't some you know religious text natural law it's a law that exists within the boundary conditions of nature and understanding it has nothing to do with a religious belief it is a science that is testable by the scientific methodology if I wanted you to believe in natural law, I would just say, oh, no, it's just the way it is. It's a religion. Don't try to do any testing on it. You, know, you just have to accept it on faith. There is no faith required in the understanding of these principles. You can test it with the scientific methodology, and it will hold true. Just start to do it. Don't take my word for it. Just put it to the test. Act a certain way. See what results you get. Act a different way. See what other results you get. That's how I tested it. Believe me, I put it to a test in my life. And I went I from like suffering to a point things. where I could not get out of bed in the morning because I was suffering so badly and so depressed and acting in, in such an immoral capacity, in such an immoral way that all the circumstances of my life made life almost unlivable. And then I started acting in a moral capacity and really understanding the difference between right and wrong and in every moment trying to choose right action over wrong behavior. And my life turned around, like uh, miraculously turned around. And that's only at an individual level. At an individuated level, it can have that kind of profound effect. Imagine when whole societies start truly exercising conscience, what happens to the quality of life in that society. We could be in the stars in the matter, on the We could be in the stars for 10 that years. Well, I, I'm sorry, I, I, was speaking, I was speaking over you. No, it's okay. But no, it's fine. I agree with you, actually. Yeah, it is within, 10, within a decade, we could change everything. But I think currently our issue is it seems to be um, ignorance uh, of all of this. And as our ignorance of natural law continues, we fall prey to uh, things like the, the natural law of freedom. Like, 
freedom is actual freedom. Yes. The illusion of freedom can often be called purchasing power. Right. And then he, and that that's part of like another like mentality is the Zeitgeist movement and why we have this train of thought is to get rid of uh, of of money as such is because we how to explain it properly. Um, I would say you recognize inherently that it doesn't exist in nature. That's the simplest way of putting it. You know, this is an artificial construct that doesn't exist inherently in nature. It is an invented construct that is based in illusion and is based in separation and is based in creating divides and is based in maintaining power advantage and power differential. Of course, it's all illusion. And then this is what many people in the so-called my truth movement and the my freedom movement don't want to understand and acknowledge because money is the most powerful religion. It is the religion that almost every being on the planet universally agrees with and believe exists legitimately. It's the most powerful religion to overcome. Even the religion of authority is not as deeply entrenched as the religion of money. Even the religion of authority, and believe me, that's deeply entrenched in this ignorant species and its condition. But money is even more deeply entrenched, if it's even possible. As difficult as that may be to believe, it's more deeply entrenched than authority. I'd say here's the second, here's the second order of the religions, okay? You have the right brain religions. You can really group them all in as one. You have the cultural religions, Christianity, uh, uh, Judaism, uh, H- Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, Taoism, Shintoism, etc., and so forth. Okay, all the so-called cultural religions. Now that they're right brain forms of religion. Now you have the New Age movement. That's the catch-all for any of the people that filtered through those other religions. That's the net that catches them underneath. That's the sieve, you know, that that, that catches the ones that got through the big the big mesh screen. Okay, so uh, the New Age movement is also right brain religion. All right, and those are low down in the pecking order of the religious power totem pole. I would say the cultural religions probably now have the least influence, whereas they once had the most, uh, although they still do have a lot of influence. I'd say the New Age movement has at least as much influence as them, if not more, and growing rapidly now, uh, which is another big cul-de-sac and a big trap, which I get in, in, in other work. We don't have time to go into that now, but... Uh, the set, the, I'd say the third form of religion that is uh, in, in order of power, growing power, ascending power, is science, scientism. I don't call it real science, but left-brain government-funded uh, uh, paradigm protection, let's call it, paradigm maintenance science, okay, um, so that we make people feel this is all that's possible and things that really are possible we want to dissuade them from ever looking into so that they never try to really advance themselves and change their uh, conditions. And then above that, there's people are continuing to search for the the cure for cancer rather than look at the cause of it. And try to treat people. people, Yes, exactly. exactly. It keeps people looking in the opposite direction of where where they really should be having their focus. Exactly right. So uh, above scientism as a religion, you have authority, you know, the belief in government as being legitimate and, you know, as uh, people believing that government somehow is not slavery, okay? That's a very powerful religion. I'd say that's the second most powerful religion on earth. The number one religion, however, is absolutely money. It is the most universally believed in and universally uh, revered religious institution and belief system on the surface of the earth. And even if humanity did away with the concept of the religion called authority, it still would not be free until we do away with the religion called money. Both well, we kind of give people. money an authority. Like currently we give it an authority over life and death. We, right. we, right. we give away ourselves in, into this illusion, into, into this. We, we just give ourselves away into this energy. And, and well, hey, man, if you don't have those magic green pieces of paper, you, just, you deserve to starve, don't you know? You exactly. know, of course. How can anybody disagree with that? No magic green papers equals starvation, and you deserve it. Of course, man. You know how could you not accept that? You know. And it almost feels as if there, there's like, um, there, they're almost like the two pillars of of our current matrix, like the one and the zero. It's, it's like the one is that club, that authority, 
that, that just beat you over the head, and then you've got the zero, of the, which is, and it beats you over the head into accepting the current monetary religion that they push. So it forces the, the so the, the authority forces the, the, the religion of money, and then the money itself then backs up the authority, the, the, the violent right. authority as well, by, by paying it in, in order to keep that, that cycle going. They're really two sides of the game, and they play off against each other. Again, it's thesis, antithesis, synthesis. It's a dialectic, and that dialectic is very strong to break because you see people on one side of the equation, you know, and they know the government is a big problem and trying to take over every aspect of our lives. And so, you know, they understand that government is part of the problem of human life, and they want to limit it. But they think corporations are so great and you know create abundance somehow when really what they're doing is limiting the access to the abundance on this planet because um, of the monetary system that's in place that is artif- an artificial construct. And you know a lot of these uh, people are like the right wing type when it comes to the political divide, which is also an illusion. But uh, they identify with that and they think you know government's the only, the only problem and you know bi- big business is fine. And corp- the corporate structure is fine when, you know, that's just another form of authority. And then, you know, you have the left-wingers and the pseudo-communist types uh, that, that, you know, they think they know what the whole problem is. And, you know, they, they want all the corporations limited, but they want government to do that limitation. They want it to get up in everybody's business and set all these limits on everything. So they're using that power structure as a mechanism to get what they want and put the controls in place that they want to see. They're never trying to really educate people in consciousness, certainly not going within, healing their own imbalances, and then helping people, other people to see their imbalances through education, and then helping them to heal those imbalances so that they can come to a higher level of consciousness and realize, hey, it's all an illusion. Not only is the monetary system an illusion, government's also an illusion. You know? So you see these two different mindsets the left and the right, the right brain imbalance and left brain imbalance, and it's just a different polarizing dialectic that's leading to the same thing. And you know what it's leading to? Slavery. So and if we want to get out of slavery and be truly free, we have to understand not only is authority and government a nonsensical, illusory religion, so is the monetary system an illusory religion that doesn't exist in nature. There is no such thing as authority in nature. We are all at the same level When it comes to rights, no one has more rights than someone else. No one has less rights than someone else. You cannot delegate a wrongdoing and call it a right that someone may perform when it causes harm. Nor can you restrict a right that does exist and say that that's a wrongdoing and you may not do it. Uh, uh, You can only claim those things. We can't really do it. We can't do those things in natural law, but unfortunately man's law goes yes. quite against what you just said because we've sure. got like trying to take people, like trying to take something that is a uh, right and turning it into a wrong in the idea of say uh, down in Florida when you, they try and jail people for people. Right. And again, but these types that's of things still, really do still exist. That's yeah. only a claim. In other words, in nature, it doesn't make it true. In point of fact, matter of fact, actual reality that is governed by natural laws, it is not true that someone can say, I have the right to stop you from imbibing a substance when you're harming no one else by by doing it. That's still not true. I can claim it all I want. I could even act upon that claim. That doesn't make it correct, true, right. It still remains a wrong. You know, I mean, we could talk about the things in man's law that people believe are legitimate. You know, again, I, I touched on some of them. Taxation. You know, people claim that's a right. The government has a right to uh, uh, claim that they can tax and then actually go and do it. It doesn't, I can't make it a right. You're taking somebody's resource without their consent, period. You're taking what they earned, what they created, what they brought forth by the sweat of their brow, by their labor, which is their property, and you're saying, I'm going to take an arbitrarily chosen amount of it based on my preference. And if you don't agree to have that confiscated, I'm going to do harm to you by either you know, beating you until you consent, caging you until you consent, taking your freedom away, binding you and taking other property away. I mean, you can't turn those forms of theft into a right by scribbling down some nonsense on a piece of paper and calling it a law. 
We're not the lawmakers. It's the universe is the maker of law. God is the maker of law, if you will. Again, I don't care if you don't like that term, then use a different one. Okay? The underlying intelligence inherent to all nature, all creation, is the maker of law. Okay? Man is not the maker of law. All we can do by writing down something that we think is in harmony with law, with natural law, is either it really is in harmony with natural law, in which case it's redundant. So in other words, don't commit murder. Don't go out and kill other people for no, for no reason. Not in defense, but just because you want to. Okay? And you have no right to do it. So you can write down, uh, don't murder anybody. Okay? And that is in harmony with natural law. But you, you writing it down didn't make it in harmony with natural law. It was already in harmony with natural law. Writing it down is just a redundancy. You, you might feel great about it that you wrote it down and be very proud of yourself. But that doesn't, isn't what made it true. Nor could you write, murder is legitimate and you may perform that action. You can write that down and pass it into law. Hitler did it plenty of time. He told people murder was legitimate. Him and the, the whole hierarchy of, of the, uh, the, the inner core of the uh, Third Reich and, and the SS and Schutzstaffel and the lawmakers of Nazi Germany, they wrote, wrote down murder was totally fine and acceptable to do, and it was the law. You know, Everything they did was legitimized by writing it down on paper and calling it man's law. Does that make it true? Does that make it in harmony with natural law? Of course not. It's only a claim. This is the just difference paper between man's paper proclamation. Yeah, it becomes just a paper proclamation that right. is just yeah. It, 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 it and like it, it not only were you speaking about like with the Nazi Germany when it comes to murdering, but also something um, scaled back is like you were just speaking of also when it comes to our taxation. Larkin Rose did a great video. On I'm al- called I'm Allowed to Rob You, and it Love goes it. very much into the depths of, of how, like, 200 years ago, sure. people made up this paper proclamation at, that in the Constitution. that this group of Congress, yeah. Yeah. exactly, can, can tax yeah. us We're and our children. We can lay and collect laws. taxes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and they can do it for all eternity. It's not even just for our lifetime, but for the, for the generations to come. And there's supposedly nothing we can do about it as long as we are as long as, that, as, our, as long as we mentally believe that that claim is legitimate, it will still hold power over us and our society. We have to fully wholesale reject the legitimacy of these forms of slavery because they are claims of ownership on something that those people who are claiming that ownership don't legitimately have a claim to, don't legitimately own. See, it's the difference between understanding what you own and what you don't own legitimately. That's what determines whether you understand natural law or not. So, you know, I think that's probably a good place to leave it and let it, you know, be and let people consider what we've said here today and, you know, go further into their understanding of this by looking into the difference between right behavior and wrong behavior based on legitimate ownership versus claimed illusory ownership. Because that's all it all comes down to. That's everything that's happening here in this world. And unfortunately, so many people don't understand this um, distinction uh, between these modes of behavior. It's sad to say, but the the world as a whole doesn't understand the difference between right and wrong, sadly. I know, you know that sounds really strange. Coming out of my mouth right now, it sounds strange. But unfortunately, that's our condition. That's how much we've been mind-controlled and brainwashed into that condition. So, In the aggregate, as a species. In the aggregate. There are individuals who deeply understand it, certainly. Okay? But again, we have to understand it so much we can communicate it to others. And that's the, the second part of natural law. You know, it's when, once you understand this and you, you are healed because you're now living in harmony with these laws because you, under, you have that knowledge deeply within you, and you understand the condition of reality that you're living in is that other people are still completely shut down in consciousness and haven't gone one iota into that level of understanding. It becomes, because you do have that level of understanding, your moral responsibility to communicate that knowledge to others as widely in as distributed a way and in as simplistic and as effective of a way 
as you are capable of doing with your talents and time to invest that time, that willpower, that energy into helping to elevate the understanding of your fellow human being. It is our moral responsibility to do that. Not because I say it is, because when you're in a position of advanced knowledge over others, you have a moral responsibility when they are still in ignorance to help to bring them up to your level of understanding. And as a matter of fact, that is the only way we can reverse this condition truly for the better. Not in a temporary way, like, like a, a, a forced revolution. You know, the founders of this country waged that effort, and it was right back within less than 100 years to tear it. Okay? Probably much less than that, actually. If we want to do this the right way permanently, it has to be done through true education. Through getting people out of their illusory modes of thinking, their false paradigm, let's just call it what it is, their false religion. That's what has to be helped to have them abandon those false illusory belief systems. We need to lend assistance in that process if we understand that the belief systems that are currently governing the experience here on Earth are false, illusory, and ultimately based in violence and ultimately based in immorality. When we do that and we elevate the consciousness of our help to elevate the consciousness of our fellow man by communicating that truth, that's when we're going to see real positive progress in humanity's condition. And that's when we will eventually build toward a true gift or resource-based economy that doesn't require this religion called money because we'll recognize our fundamental oneness at that point and recognize we are all in this together. There is no true separation. At some level of consciousness, we are truly one. We are truly united. Okay, unity consciousness does exist at a fundamental level of consciousness and awareness. And we'll see ourselves as simply one family sharing an experience here on earth. You know, we wouldn't think of if there was a family, a mother, a father, and a boy and a girl child, that they would invent a monetary system. No, they would just have resources available to them in their environment and share them amongst each other because they love each other, because they care about each other and want to share what they have. That's the level of consciousness we ultimately need to get to. So I'll leave it there uh, for, for that at, uh, for now, uh, and I'll, I'll just give my website for people that want to uh, look a little further into my work. Uh, my website is whatonearthishappening.com. Again, my name is Mark Passier, E-A-S-S-I-O. My website is whatonearthishappening.com. There's a huge library of information on that site, videos, many, many, many podcasts. I think there's now about 148 podcasts to date on that site. You can go there. I highly recommend starting with podcasts. The videos are a nice supplement. Uh, The presentation give a very good visual uh, representation to go along with the the, uh, material that is being spoken, but the audio series and the podcast section is really the meat of the um, website. And if you go in order from podcast number one through in a linear progression, not skipping around, and you listen to those podcasts in order at your own pace, you will gain the maximum value from that information because the later material has prerequisite knowledge in the earlier material. So it's meant to be taken as a tapestry uh, presented in a linear stepwise progression of knowledge building on top of knowledge. So that's my recommendation. Again, the website, whatonearthishappening.com. And uh, I want to really thank you, Kevin, for bringing me on to the show today uh, and uh, giving me the platform to share this uh, information. Thank you for coming on and sharing it. I, I appreciate it. I mean, there's nothing I I believe that people people in the Zeitgeist movement already get that um, Fight Club idea of like that which you own ends up owning you, so they're not right. really as materialistic. Right. And like, if you look into like uh, the the Venus Project, if you go there and look at their FAQ, um, they're frequently asked questions. I think it's like number 108 is all about like what is the Venus Project's thing on possession, and it's very much in that in, in that mentality of like, if you want the burden of ownership of all this stuff and you want to hoard these items and you want to have to protect them and stuff, so and so, that's on you. That's right. But that's the reason why they're trying to extend it into creating a, a situation where we all have that access abundance so that we can uh, we, we can access these things and not necessarily have to own them. 
like we could have like a car share type of thing for people rather than um, each person has to own and maintain their own car. Right. It, it, it's a very different mentality, and I don't think people are all. It would lessen the for burden that. on on the earth on on you know what the strain that we're putting through taking uh, all these resources from the earth at the pace that we are, you know and. Uh, I, 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 I love the concept of what you brought up regarding ownership, okay? There is a legitimate form of ownership, but it doesn't mean to have attachment to things, okay? Exactly. You want to have attachment to anything, have attachment to truth, not to things. Uh, I believe it was the Muslim philosopher uh, um, ta, uh, ta, uh, Ali Talib, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was that teacher. Um, he said... <clears throat> The release of attachment does not mean that you should not own anything, but that nothing should own you. And that's what real freedom is. So I think that's a perfect quote to end the day on. Thank you again for, for sharing your, your knowledge and, and, and I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Keep up the great work. And, and yeah, everybody check out uh, What on Earth is Spinning. And uh, specifically, the, the, the Natural Law Seminar, you have one uh, YouTube, I think is really great. If you can actually find a day to sit there and watch, like, the first, the, the first third of it in the morning and then the, 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 the middle of it during the afternoon and then get yourself a piece of dinner and watch the, the last part at night, it really, in one day, could give you a nice, solid base-level knowledge of really where people need to know, what people need to know, one the subject of natural law as to progress further afterwards. Absolutely. I think it also is a good starting point for people. And then the podcast can really supplement that work. So that's a good suggestion. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to take away anything from your podcast because it's also something that, that is really great. And I learned sure. a lot from over the years that I was listening to it. And, and I, I couldn't, I don't think I could have gotten to the, the level of consciousness I'm at currently without, without that information. I just feel that like your, that seminar that you have on, on YouTube is a really concise block of information that people could definitely consume in, 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 in almost one sitting, like at least in right. one day. Right. And, and not have to, and, and in order to, to get a good base level knowledge. I'm not saying you're going to know now, everything. But provide a foundation, that. yes. Exactly. I, exactly. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm glad you see it in that regard. And hopefully other people will too. They can, they can go up and check it out in my video section. It's right there at the top of the video section. So thank you Kevin, again, I want to thank you for the work you're doing. You're doing a phenomenal job, and you keep up the great work as well. So thanks for providing this opportunity, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Take good care. And uh, I guess one last thing, everybody, uh, to throw out there, please check out the Psychos Movement as well as the Venus Project. Um, in order to gain a deeper knowledge of some of the things that we are also discussing today, as well as specifically, as we, we've just mentioned, whatonearthishappening.com. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.